Hello, my name is Lakmir Chabwa, and I'll be speaking today about sepsis and COVID-19 and the role for the SARF-100. First, an important disclosure, I am the chair of the Scientific Advisory Board for Xthera Medical. So <clears throat> I think this um, all starts for me with a, a little bit of a story. So I got involved with um, Xthera via a very peculiar um, project. So there was a DARPA project, and for those of you who don't know what DARPA is, DARPA stands for the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, and they have a singular and enduring mission, which is to make pivotal investments and in breakthrough technologies for national security. This is a U.S. government agency that lives within the Department of Defense, and their main claim to fame is the development of the internet. And they are sort of famous for <clears throat> taking on very unusual products that are very forward-looking. So in 2013, I was invited to join this program on behalf of Next Stage Medical, which was asked to perform the platform aspect of the program. And the program that DARPA was developing was based on a future scenario where they envisioned a pathogen that was untreatable, untreatable either due to resistance to novelty or a bioweapon, and they envisioned a virus or a bacteria um, that was something that had no current treatments, no vaccines immediately available, and they wanted to develop a device <clears throat> that worked like a dialysis machine, but instead of doing dialysis and performing hemofiltration or hemodialysis, actually was able to treat and remove bacteria, viruses, fungi, and toxins. So that was the program, that was the idea. Um, I remember at the time thinking this is very science fiction and this will never happen. Um, obviously, they were a lot smarter than I was because um, they were actually imagining something like we're dealing with right now. <clears throat> and the way this program is set up, which makes it very different than the usual government agency, is it's set up like the Champions League uh, in football and for the Americans listening, soccer. <clears throat> and what that basically means is that it's set up like a playoff. So all these different uh, companies come in, they have different devices and different ways that their device might achieve this goal of being able to, in an extracorporeal system, treat bac bacteremia, viremia, fungemia, etc. And then each of the different companies and their devices are given a series of tasks. And then the tasks are assigned, and then they all go back to their companies and their labs, and they come back three to four months later, and everyone shows their results. And the devices that don't do well get knocked out, <clears throat> and the devices that continue to do well get more government funding, <clears throat> more development potential, and they continue to move up into the playoff. And that is how I got exposed, because the device that won this dialysis-like therapeutic program to remove bacteria, virus, fungi, and toxin is, you guessed it, the Seraph 100, which is made by Xterra Medical. And that was in 2013. And... Um, part and parcel of the work that the scientists at the company um, had done also due to the work of the DARPA program, this device is now available in Europe. It is CE marked and it's also approved for COVID in the U.S. under an emergency use authorization. <clears throat> so what is this device that essentially looked like Real Madrid with, you know, Ronaldo and just absolutely smoked all the competition? And it's really very interesting because essentially polyethylene beads that have endpoint attached heparin to it. And it turns out that immobilized heparin um, binds bacteria, viruses, fungi, and toxins in a very similar way to heparin sulfate does uh, in things in mammalian tissue. And I'll talk to you more about this. And so I think most of us think of heparin as the heparin we dose patients with to make someone anticoagulated. But heparin has a large series of other properties that make it quite ideal for this. And so basically, you can think of the device as a very large hemoperfusion system that exposes the blood to a very large surface area of heparin. So you're talking about 40 meters squared. Now, a similar size cartridge, if it was a dialysis filter, would offer something in the vicinity of two meters squared of surface area. And so it's really an enormous amount of heparin surface that's being provided that does this activity. And, you know, one of the more interesting program lessons of DARPA was, you know, you go into all these rounds of stuff 
and you know you have to create these models and tasks for the devices to go through. And so I was on the Battelle Next Stage side of this um, program of this playoff, and so I wasn't really developing any of these products. I was more developing the hurdles and helping with the management of the platform and how it runs on a dialysis machine. And so there's a very well characterized pig model where you give 10 to the ninth E. coli to it. You give it to the pig intravenously and it's a great model because in three to four hours later, the pig is dead. And along the way, it gives you a really nice pattern of classic sepsis type of markers. You know, you have coagulopathy, fever, hypotension. And, you know, if you're a lab researcher, this is nice. You come in the morning, you whack the pig, you get it sick, you do all your experiments, you draw the blood, you give the treatments. And the pig is dead and, you know, you're, you're home in time for dinner. And that works great to do a very nice pig sepsis experiment. <clears throat> but this was not a good model for what we were trying to do because we were trying to take a, get a sepsis model where the animal gets sick and then you have an opportunity to put it on a dialysis-like therapeutic, um, whether it be the Xterra or something else. And so we wanted the pig to look a lot like this pig model, but we didn't want it to get so sick and die so fast. So the guys at Patel said, this is really simple. We'll just dial it down and give the pig 10 to the eighth E. coli, and we'll just calibrate the amount of bacteria we get, and we'll get this very nice, uh, you know, dead pig septic model that goes for like three to eight hours, or six to eight hours, which would be nicer. And you give 10 to the eighth to the pig and nothing happens. The pig doesn't get sick, it doesn't get a fever, none of its markers of uh, coagulation or um, immunity alter. So we were like, well, this is, doesn't make any sense. So we went back, we checked the E. coli to make sure it was the correct E. coli. It was, we plated it out, and then we give 10 to the ninth E. coli and the pig dies immediately. We give 10 to the eighth, nothing happens. And what we learned from this experiment is something which we tell people all the time, which is higher mammals tolerate bacteremia uh, quite well up to a certain point. Now, I'm not saying the critical threshold is 10 to the 8th versus 10 to the 9th, but in this pig experiment, it was. And what we learned along the way is that this capacity to manage bacteremia is not an immune response because there's no time for immune cells to deal with this massive load of bacteria. What we learned is that it has to do a lot with heparin, or in the case of a human, heparin, sulfate, which is in your endothelial glycocalyx. And it turns out that heparin, and this has been shown uh, for a very long time, is very good. It draws in viruses, it binds bacteria, and there's all kinds of examples where heparin has this ability to bind up various um, um, microbial agents. And I think it's important to understand this, and if there's nothing else you glean from this talk. I hope you remember this one thing that soluble heparin and surface heparin are fundamentally different. So soluble heparin is heparin you inject into a patient who has a pulmonary embolus and the PTT goes up and they're anticoagulated because that soluble heparin solubilizes in blood and interacts with the coagulation system. When heparin is a surface, it behaves very differently. It still has some very nice anticoagulant effects, but it doesn't dramatically activate antithrombin-3. And what it does is it actually provides this extraordinary surface that has various therapeutic effects against various infections. And the reason why we know this is because heparin sulfate is one of the largest constituents of the endothelial glycocalyx. So the endothelial glycocalyx is this inner lining on the endothelium. And what we find is that this gel-like complex that sits on the inside of vessels is not just there to keep things from clotting and, and soaking up microthrombi. What it also does, in addition to protecting endothelial cells, is it has these profound secular immunologic effects where it binds up viruses, bacteria, and other microorganisms. And what you see on the right here is this is heparin sulfate, and what is in your glycocalyx is largely heparan sulfate. Now, they're not identical, but as you can see, they are extremely similar. And when heparin 
is a surface, it behaves a lot more like heparan sulfate. And essentially what this device is, and we learned this in the DARPA program, is the Seraph 100 is effectively endothelial glycocalyx replacement therapy. So look at all the things that it binds up. So it has extraordinary binding, and it binds MRSA, Klebsiella, E. coli, streptomonia, acetobacter, bactobamani, serratia marchesans, pseudomonas. The list is endless. It, it binds up viruses, Zika, adenovirus, endotoxin. It, it has this broad ability to soak up all of these things which we recognize to be problematic in patients who have severe sepsis and septic shock. And it removes SARS-CoV-2, which obviously is part and parcel while I'm giving this talk. And so this surface that is heparin, not soluble heparin, but heparin the surface, also has adhesion of pro-inflammatory cytokines, but not in the same way that like a cytosorb does, where it takes out good cytokines and bad cytokines. Some of this also appears to be based on the fact of removing the putative agent. And so, you know, the effects of the endothelial glycocalyx and heparin sulfate are regulating vascular permeability, microvascular tone. It inhibits microvascular thrombosis, which I think is something which we're all very sensitive to with COVID, and it regulates leukocyte adhesion. So, you know, when I think about the management of sepsis and septic shock, there's sort of three large buckets of things that we do for these patients. So the first and foremost is source control, right? If they have dead tissue, we get rid of it, they have an abscess, we put something into it and get all the pus out. So for a person in whom you cannot drain a pus pocket, if they have completely unregulated bacteremia or viremia, they're going to overwhelm the host. So the Seraph 100 allows you to remove pathogens from the bloodstream, which is a very nice effect. Additionally, it absorbs microthrombi, like the endothelial calyx does, and it helps maintain this um, antithrombotic type of environment. And it also removes damps in certain PAMPs and impacts positively um, a procoagulant state. And these two impacts are part and parcel of why we see the decreases in pro-inflammatory cytokines in patients who receive the treatment. Um, and in some patients, because of the former two events, pathogen removal primarily, you also see improved hemodynamics and improved oxygenation. And importantly, the device does not remove antibiotics or antimicrobials. Specifically, it does not remove remdesivir. So I'm going to show you two uh, case reports where it been published. Um, this is some really beautiful work done by Jan Kilstein. And basically, it's a woman that um, was admitted with bacteremia. She was a dialysis patient. And um, it sort of makes it easier to do an extracorporeal treatment when you already have an access. And what they did is they took this woman who had a uh, gram positive bacteremia and staph growing and decided to see what the seraph could do. Um, and this was not a patient who was, uh, you know, sort of in profound septic shock that was unmanageable. It was just someone who was bacteremic getting their antibiotics and they wanted to see if they could impact the bacteremia. And so what you can see here is the Seraph setup, and they took samples pre and post filter, and they did it at five minutes, 120 minutes, and 240 minutes. And what you see is that in the first two samples, on the arterial side, the blood culture grows positive. But on the post filter side, it consistently grows negative, demonstrating that in a clinically relevant scenario of positivity of blood culture, the device works as advertised and can actively remove um, microorganisms. But I think that, you know, that's very cool. And I think that's a beautiful case. But I think what most of us are dealing with and wanting to know the answer to is, does this have an effect on um, uh, COVID-19? And the answer is yes. So this is Steve Olson's group and Kevin Chung's group at Walter Reed Medical Center in Washington, D.C., which is a very large um Military hospital. This is where the president goes um, for his or her care. Um, and um, what they did is they took two patients who had uh, severe COVID. They were both in shock, and they both got serif treatments. And this is a 67-year-old man with non-insulin-dependent diabetes who was very sick. 
and receive two serif treatments here in yellow and over here. And um, you know, all of you can access this paper. It's open access when you get a chance. But what you can see here is after the initiation of the treatment, there's this dramatic uh, impact on the norepinephrine dose. And you can see that the hemodynamics uh, improve throughout. And we also see that in this patient, they went from being viremic to non-viremic after two treatments, which um, I think is very important given that we now see around 50, 30 to 50 percent of patients with severe COVID are, are viremic. And the second patient is a 59-year-old male, uh, very similar to treatments. And what you can see is this very dramatic decrease in norepinephrine dose, uh, improvement in blood pressure, and both these patients did well. And this patient also demonstrated a very nice um, decrease in IL-6 over um, the two treatments. Unfortunately, um, this patient, they were unable to get um, viremic levels. And since the, um, and these two cases are what led the FDA to granting the emergency use authorization. And I think it's important to understand that what we don't have are large randomized controlled data of the Xterra Seraph 100 in any large cohort of anything. And, and while DARPA may have been prescient in imagining the pandemic that we have, while they may have been prescient in helping to develop a device that was ready for it, the pandemic came about a year too soon. Um, had there been another year for um, some other clinical trials to be up and running, I think the Seraph 100 would have been in a much better p position to show all the things it can remove in more clinical cohorts. Um, I mean, obviously you don't plan for a pandemic that well. Um, well, I guess that's not true. Some countries have demonstrated they plan well for a pandemic. Um, we in the United States have clearly not planned well for the pandemic. Um, I, well, I think what is a more accurate thing to say is that we um, don't and didn't anticipate the pandemic in a way to have the clinical data we would love to be able to show you that's currently in development to demonstrate all the positive impacts it's had. So approximately 80 to 100 patients have now been treated uh, with the Seraph 100 and COVID-19. Um, as a consequence of this, we've gotten much more thoughtful about the right patient to treat and, and at what time point. And, um, and the short version of this is that patients who are developing respiratory distress and just intubated or just prior to intubation appears to be the optimal entry point to offer them this treatment and improve outcomes. And there are lots of data that are in development that we'll be looking forward to publishing soon. Um, so in the interest of staying on time, I'll summarize by saying that the Seraph is a broad spectrum device for rapid treatment of bloodstream infections, including those caused by drug resistant pathogens. Um, reducing the pathogen load, particularly in patients for whom uh, reduction in blood levels of a pathogen, either due to resistance or novelty or lack of other therapeutics, may significantly improve outcomes. Um, the heparin surface that is on the Seraph device is profoundly antithrombogenic and has these very elegant antipathogen properties, and this emulates the endothelial glycocalyx. And I, I think that I think of this device as being endothelial glycocalyx replacement therapy. Um, and I, I think the most important take home message is the Seraph is safe. It's well tolerated. I didn't have an opportunity with the allowed time to show you all the safety data, but this is an extremely safe treatment. Um, and uh, we are hopeful this is going to make an impact um, for uh, patients with COVID-19 and uh, later on with other pathogens.